Thank you again. I hope you all had an enjoyable lunch. I thought it was lovely. And uh, I don't know if I could get me a glass of sparkling water. Um, I will try not to cough. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for so many people for staying. I know you have busy lives. And uh, so we talked about empowerment, and now we're going to talk about recovery. And uh, once again, the topic was uh, making it real. So I'll start by uh, trying to come to a definition of what recovery is. I'll try to uh, delineate some of the reasons, uh, some of the ways in which it differs from empowerment, although they're very related concepts. I will address the question of, is recovery possible for people diagnosed with severe mental health difficulties? And then I'll talk about some of the practical steps of how we help people to recover. Um, so we have a number of definitions of recovery. And we've taken these definitions from uh, a number of sources, mostly from talking to people who were diagnosed with severe mental illness and doing research, uh, qualitative research with people around their own journeys of recovery <coughs> and trying to draw out the um, strands uh, that they have in common. And we've also looked at recovery from the standpoint of disability, not just psychiatric disability, but disability generally. Because we find that with people with um, um, severe physical disabilities, uh, recovery is looked at in a, uh, in a way that's a little different from the meaning that a lot of people assume that it has from the uh, uh, idea of that you get better from something. If a person, for example, is a quadriplegic, um, by current medical standards, they're going to remain a quadriplegic for the rest of their lives. But that doesn't mean that in a social sense, they cannot experience recovery in the uh, various uh, aspects of life, such as living where they want to live, uh, going to school, having a job, having a social life, getting married, having children, uh, partaking of all the aspects of life uh, that are part of what makes uh, life enjoyable and, and, and a positive experience. So recovery does not necessarily mean the absence of symptoms. What it does mean is that you're leading the life that you want to be living or moving the direction of leading the life that you want to be living. That you see a future for yourself and that you see that you're moving in the direction of that future and that you have steps in mind that you are taking to get you from the point where you are now to the point where, the, where you want to be. Uh, that if you have problems along the way, which uh, we all do, not because we have necessarily diagnoses of, of severe mental health difficulties, but because we're human beings and uh, we experience difficulties, that you have support for problems as they arise, uh, that you define when you're having problems, you define what kind of assistance you need and that you're able to get that assistance to keep you moving in a positive direction. And that for people with, with uh, severe mental health problems, we see this as a move from a very unsatisfying role, the role of being a mental patient, to the role of being an active participant in life and being a citizen. So these are all um, elements that help us to define what we mean by recovery. And I want to reiterate again that recovery does not necessarily mean the absence of symptoms. It means finding ways to manage symptoms um, that work for, for you. And recovery doesn't necessarily mean um, being off medication. It means using medications, if you choose to use them, in the ways that you find supportive and helpful to keep you moving in the right direction. Uh, there are ways that people have found to manage symptoms that may continue to exist and to integrate them into their lives. And we see this, for example, with people who hear voices, uh, with people who experience extreme anxiety, with people who have um, uh, various kinds of, 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 of obsessions or compulsions, and all kinds of, of symptoms, that they find ways to integrate these things into their lives uh, and manage their symptoms. For example, one person that I know in the United States is a fellow with a PhD, his name is Ed Knight, who had, um, also has a severe psychiatric diagnosis. He actually had his PhD before he first became, um, began having psychiatric problems, and it was uh, when he tells one of the doctors in the hospital that he had a PhD, he found out that they had charged him and was having delusion. Um, 
But in fact, uh, he has recovered. He is in now uh, a very uh, uh, responsible uh, uh, position in uh, in the uh, uh, in working in recovery with a large uh, uh, mental, uh, mental health service agency in the United States. But he continues to hear voices. And uh, I was at a meeting one time where he told about uh, that sometimes when he's going to driving to a very very uh, what he knows is going to be a very very stressful meeting, and he'll start hearing voices. He'll pull over to the side of the road. And he will spend 10 or 15 minutes using self-help te techniques that he's developed in order to um, uh, alleviate the symptoms so that he can then go on and be an effective uh, uh, manager and, and, uh, and conduct a very stressful meeting. So that people can learn to manage um, symptoms uh, if they continue to exist in ways that they can integrate into their lives so that they're, le they're leading the lives that they want to lead. Um, we see recovery as kind of the next step beyond empowerment. Uh, we can be, help people to become, to have a sense of being fully empowered and being fully engaged in their lives as service users and having a say in what happens to them and having a say in how services are managed and run, but they're still primarily service users. Recovery is moving beyond just being a service user to being um, a person with a job a person with a career, a person with a satisfying life. And that doesn't mean necessarily that you stop using services, but that you use services in a different way, that your primary identity is not as a service user. Your primary identity is in the work you do and the life you live. And the services that you may need to use are just an adjunct um, to, uh, to the rest of your life, rather than being the center of your life. So moving out of what, what, what's called the patient role and moving into what are, for almost everybody, much more satisfying roles in life. People who've been diagnosed with severe mental illness uh, are coming out of a service system in which most people have been, who have been trained as psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, whatever, um, have been trained to think that people who have these diagnoses don't get better. And therefore, they approach the people that they work with very often in ways that reinforce this message that nobody ever really gets better. It's a very um, hopeless message. And it's hopeless not just for the um, people with the diagnosis. It's really hopeless for the workers, too. It's very frustrating to think that the people you work with aren't, aren't really going to develop and change. And when professionals get involved in doing recovery work, I think they become just as energized as the clients do by helping people to to move through life in a much more positive direction. But we have to remember that the, uh, the medical model of mental illness still continues to train people to believe that, that, that people with these diagnoses don't get better, and that that's a barrier that, that makes um, moving towards recovery very difficult and making services recovery-oriented very dif difficult because a lot of professionals still continue to believe that people aren't going to recover, or that people who recover are rare and exceptional people who aren't uh, um, typical of people um, who have these diagnoses. Um, in the traditional model, the most that people were supposed to hope for was that they could reach a point of stability, so that uh, it, uh, a lot of services still continue to, be, to evaluate people um, uh, by criteria like, are they staying on their medication? Have they avoided rehospitalization? Uh, rather than asking questions about uh, are they leading the kind of lives they want to lead um, and are they uh, doing something useful and productive and do they feel they have a meaningful role in life. Um, when we talk about outcomes, and that's become a big buzzword in mental health these days, um, it's very important that uh, we look at what outcomes are really important and what outcomes are really important to the people uh, who are in the process of recovery. So if we develop outcome measures that just measure stability, then we're not really looking at helping people to recover, we're just looking at helping people to remain stable. Uh, but if instead we develop outcome measures that really measure um, people's uh, success along continuums of, of living more independently, working uh, or doing something productive with their time, being more satisfied with their life, uh, having more meaningful personal relationships and so forth, if we begin to measure those kinds of outcomes, then we're helping uh, to, to measure um, and, and help people succeed at real genuine recovery. Uh, when 
the entire service system was uh, oriented toward believing that people didn't recover and that the most you could hope for was helping people to become stable. Uh, it led to a whole series of low expectations. And those low, low expectations permeated every level of the mental health service system and beyond the mental health service system. Um, so the staff had very low expectations. They uh, uh, may have thought, well, maybe this person someday can live in, 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 a, uh, um, in a group home. Um, and uh, maybe we can get their symptoms under control, and maybe we can, we can get them stabilized on long-term medication. It led to uh, family members having low expectations. Uh, well, uh, uh, I'd like to see him be as independent as possible, but he's never really going to have a job, or he's never really going to have a, uh, a girlfriend or a serious relationship, or uh, the most he can help for is to lead some kind of life where at least he's not going into the hospital all the time. Um, low expectations on the part of the community, and we've talked a little bit about, about stigma and how uh, people with, low, with psychiatric diagnoses are regarded, that uh, uh, for the general public, a lot of times knowing that somebody has a diagnosis of severe mental illness meant having that whole set of low expectations and, and, and also being afraid of people and wanting to keep them isolated and apart from society. And it also led to low expectations within the individual themselves. Uh, I can't tell you how many people have introduced themselves to me over the years as I'm a schizophrenic before they told me their names. They had so internalized that sense of that was the sum to totality of their lives. Uh, that they couldn't even begin to envision um, a life beyond being a schizophrenic. And that's very, very sad and makes it very, very hard to help people along in their recovery journey. Um, I think that the, the, it's a kind of a, a circular process whether low expectations in the community lead to stigma discrimination or whether stigma discrimination leads to low expectations or so forth. But the fact is that we have to face the fact that um, the community out there is often very hostile once they know that somebody has uh, a diagnosis of severe mental illness. They often uh, have even worse than low expectations, negative expectations, and that leads to wanting to keep people isolated. Well, if they're not in hospitals anymore, let's at least keep them away from us, out of our communities. Um, and of course, they don't know because uh, uh, it doesn't show on the outside, but uh, their neighbors, friends, coworkers, colleagues, uh, may themselves be people who've been diagnosed with, with serious mental illness and are in recovery. And they don't see that, they just see these, these constant negative images um, of how awful these people are and, and, and you know, keep them away from us. So low expectations have, have uh, dragged down the, the, the move towards recovery across the board. Um, and I think we need to look and look seriously at people who have recovered and help to help understand the process of recovery that people have gone through and use that to guide um, what we should be doing to help other people towards recovery. Uh, it doesn't happen so much anymore. It still happens, but not as often as it used to. But it used to happen um, when someone like me or someone like Dan Fisher would get up at a conference. I look back to Judy, some of those early conferences that we went to um, back in, uh, what was it then, 19, what did you say, 1978, uh, where people would say, oh, the only reason you're okay is because you probably never had schizophrenia. You were misdiagnosed. Rather than saying, oh, people really can recover, it was like, well, I know that people can't recover, so you're just not like them and there's nothing we can learn from you. Um, and one of the analogies I like to make is with um, AIDS. Uh, when AIDS was first um, defined and diagnosed and people began to understand what AIDS was, uh, the uh, medical wisdom of, the, of those early days was that nobody, once you got a diagnosis of AIDS, nobody lived beyond five years. And then what happened? Some people began living beyond five years. And that's really how progress in, in, in learning about understanding AIDS and what helps AIDS um, um, was done by looking at what were the factors that helped people to live beyond that, of those five years. Um, and to the point where now, in, in, at least in, in, in wealthy countries with good medical care system, AIDS is now becoming um, a chronic manageable disease rather than a death sentence. But what if those AIDS researchers had said, oh, all these people who are living beyond five years, they obviously, by our definition, don't have AIDS, so we don't have to look at them. Well, that's kind of what happens in psychiatry, uh, or has happened until relatively recently. 
that those of us who have recovered have been seen as exceptional cases, um, as cases of misdiagnosis, and as, something, as somebody that nobody needed to learn anything from. Um, so in moving forward towards recovery, one of the things that has happened is beginning to study people who have recovered and trying to understand what were the multiple factors that helped them to recover so that we can design um, treatment and support systems that move more people towards recovery and do it in ways that don't have to that they don't have to reach the, the, the absolute depths first. Um, I'm engaged in some uh, research right now, and uh, there's been a lot of research done, certainly in the United States, looking at people who recover and understanding people's recovery journeys. And it's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating research to do. It's, it's uh, the research project I'm doing uh, with some colleagues at, at the Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation is a qualitative research project in which we are analyzing uh, people's recovery journeys. We sit them down for an interview that lasts several hours um, and which they basically tell, tell their stories. It's a very unstructured interview um, in which they basically tell their stories. They talk about what happened to them, how they became um, diagnosed, what their, what their lives were like, uh, what kinds of interventions they had, uh, what kind of supports they had, where they are now, try to identify how they got to where they are now and, and the criteria for being in the study is that you have had a diagnosis of, of serious mental illness and that by your own evaluation you are well along on your recovery journey. And we're trying to, to uh, through analyzing these interviews, tease out some of the, the common strands that, that uh, have helped people to recover. Um, and some of those are, uh, for most people, there was a key person in their lives, somebody who believed in them. Uh, as, as, as more than one person who put it, has put it, somebody who believed in me even when I didn't believe in myself. And that key person might be a, a, a professional mental health worker of one sort or another. It might be a friend, it might be a relative, it might be a neighbor. Uh, but whoever it was, it was somebody who, was, who they really felt was there for them and, and, and believed in them and, and, and were, were there even when they were in the absolute depths of despair. Uh, another strand that we identified was um, that there was support available. And that support varied in what form it might have taken. Um, uh, for a lot of people, it included uh, professional mental health services. For a number of people, it was medication. Uh, for a number of people, it was some form of therapy. It was peer support. It was always in combination. There were always a number of, of, of different kinds of support that people utilized at different times. But that they, they found support and it was available for them and, and it really helped them as they moved through the various stages of recovery. Um, for many people, uh, medication was an important part of the recovery, not all. Um, some people did not use medication, some people got off medication in order to recover, and some people continued to use medication. Uh, but for everyone who was using medication, it was very clear that they were actively involved in choosing what medications worked for them and how to use the medications. That it wasn't just uh, staying on a level of medication that somebody else decided was important, but that it was using medications in a way that they felt were contrib was contributing to their own recovery. And again, for many people, one-to-one um, -one, uh, psychotherapy of one form or another uh, was valuable. Um, and often, the, uh, it was therapy that went beyond, um, it was just fortuitous for some people that they found a therapist who really uh, worked with them in ways that were, were unique. And one, one woman particularly uh, in our research who had uh, uh, come from a, a long background of, of a very chaotic life uh, in which she was um, living very marginally, she was homeless at times, living very marginally, and was now working in a, in a, a, as a paid job at a peer support center. Um, and had, uh, um, I think she was at that point the assistant director of the center, was feeling good about herself, was uh, 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 doing better economically, um, and yet she was still living in this very, very marginal, uh, she was living in a basement, which was a pretty abysmal uh, living situation. And uh, her therapist was the one who encouraged her, you know, you have enough money to buy a house. And uh, me, buy a house? And the therapist was the one who actually, you know, helped her see over a period of time that she could buy a house, helped her to do things like read the real estate ads and go looking at houses. And, and finally, uh, she found a house that she could afford and she went to the bank and she made all the arrangements. And it came the day when she had to go uh, sign the papers for the house to be hers. 
And she absolutely got cold feet and she walked into the therapist's office and the therapist said, uh, I, uh, you know, you're supposed to be over at the bank signing the paper. I can't go, I'm too scared. And the therapist actually went with her to the bank and, and, and sat with her while she signed the papers. Um, and and uh, so it was often somebody who went above and beyond the call of duty um, to help a person to recover. And that, that, that uh, doesn't happen for everybody, but when it does happen, it's, it's, it's very special. Um, and for many of the people in our study, another factor that was very important in helping them toward recovery uh, was some form of spiritual practice. And that might mean uh, reconnecting with, uh, connecting or reconnecting with organized religion, sometimes the religion they were born into and sometimes another religion. Or it might mean a very personal kind of spiritual journey. But a number of people identified uh, that spiritual connection as being very, very important to the recovery. Um, recovery is very much, I think, connected to, uh, when I say that support is important, support of all forms, the peer support is particularly valuable in recovery because being matched with someone who's further along in, in their own recovery helps the person in a lot of different ways. It helps the person to see that recovery is possible. It helps the person because they um, can develop a relationship that goes beyond a um, professional over a desk office kind of relationship and into real daily life. Um, and it also helps the person who's providing the peer support. Um, and in some writing that Dan Fisher and I did recently, uh, he related a, a story that happened to him. Um, he is a, somebody who's recovered from schizophrenia, and he still continues to work one day a week as a psychiatrist uh, in a community mental health center near Boston. And this uh, center runs a peer support program in which people who are further along in their recovery get paid jobs working, being matched with a person who's uh, just at the beginning of their own recovery journey. And Dan um, does therapy, um, does psychotherapy with the people who are um, um, receiving the peer support. And he also runs a group once a month for the people who are providing the peer support to help facilitate whatever you know, difficulties they may be having in being peer supporters. Um, so one day, one of the guys came into his office for an appointment. This was a guy who recently been matched up with a peer supporter. Um, and he was just uh, grinning ear to ear. And Dan said to him, uh, Joe, you're obviously feeling good. And he said, yeah, I am, Doc. And uh, Dan said, well, what, what do you think is helping you? And he says, well, you're helping me. And Dan says, look, I've known you for a long time, and there must be more than that. Uh, because, you know, he's been talking, but so more than that. And he said, well, look, everybody here, the therapists and the program is helping me. But he says, you know, what's really helping me is, 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 is Tom, my peer support person. And Dan says, oh, tell me about that. And he says, well, you know, it's really great because we can sit and talk about all kinds of things, and he can do things with me that, that you can't do, Doc. He says, no, no offense to you, Doc, but you can't, you, we can't go out for a pizza or you know, go out and throw the frisbee around and just kind of you know, shout about stuff. And, and yet Tom does that with me, and it just feels great. So Dan said, yeah, you're right. I, you know, because of the nature of my role as a psychiatrist and, and, and that I you know, have to see a lot of people, I can't go out and do those things with you, but I'm really glad you have Tom to do that with you. And then when it came around time for him to meet with Tom and the other peer supporters, um, and Tom was a person who had been gotten into this program because he was considered to be very well along in his own recovery. He um, uh, had been out of the hospital for quite a long time. He um, uh, was on a very low dose of medication. He'd been living in his own apartment. Um, and um, he absolutely startled Dan when he said, you know, being involved in this program, being a peer supporter, and being able to help Joe he said, that was the start of my own deinstitutionalization. And Dan just found that so astonishing because by other sets of standards, this guy had been deinstitutionalized for a long time. But by his own standards, until he started being able to do something meaningful for somebody else and being able to give back um, what he had learned and being able to help another person along in his own journey of recovery, it was only then that he really felt that he had stopped being a patient and started becoming a uh, a valued person and a person who was giving something of value. And it was interesting because it really confirmed some of the stuff I've been, we've been finding in, in, the, uh, in the research study uh, because giving back was a very important element for a lot of people when they felt that they could help somebody else who'd been uh, who, in situations that they'd been in. They could take these very negative experiences that had happened to them and all the fear and all the pain and all the suffering that they'd been through and use it instead in a positive way to help somebody else. 
Recovery, we see recovery as a journey. It's something that goes on. It doesn't have a necessary endpoint. You can be further along in your journey of recovery, and yet that doesn't mean that, that like anybody else in life, you may not experience uh, some setbacks. Uh, you may not, from time to time, need to go back into the hospital, maybe, or need to go on medication for a while. This doesn't mean you're not recovered. It just means that recovery is not, like most things in life, just a steady upward path. But instead, it has its ups and downs, its hills and valleys, plateaus, um, and that it's all part of this long-term journey that people are on. Uh, that really is very similar, in many ways, to the lives of people who have never been diagnosed with serious mental illness. Because if you look at anybody's life and you sort of slice it into the different dimensions of life, education, work, housing, relationships, uh, we see that everybody's life if you graph each one of those things separately, you're at different points uh, in the different domains. Uh, you're, you may be very satisfied with your education, but you may not be leading the, having the job you want to have. Uh, you may think your housing is not where you, where you want it to be. Uh, you might think uh, uh, you may be in a great, involved in a great relationship, and then the relationship breaks up, and so that, in that domain of life, you're going down. So people's lives are very complex and very complicated. Recovery doesn't mean, oh, everything's going great in every area. It just means that, that you have the, the, the strength and the resilience uh, to deal with the inevitable setbacks of life because that's part of, that's part of living. Uh, one of the uh, researchers at the uh, Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, Dr. Courtney Harding, has done some wonderful research on uh, recovery and what she's now calling resilience. And she's now um, looking at... Uh, factors that contribute to resilience, because we find that people are incredibly strong, have an incredible ability to come back from very, very difficult life circumstances. And uh, what she did uh, some years ago was she started a longitudinal study that has now gone on for, uh, I believe, about 30 years, uh, following a group of patients who were uh, uh, diagnosed with serious mental illness uh, and were in Vermont State Hospital as long-term patient, patients. The state of Vermont is a small, small rural state, and it's a pretty easy state to do longitudinal research in because uh, people who are born in Vermont tend to stay in Vermont. So she was able to locate these people uh, many years out from the time that they were discharged from the hospital. And over a long period of time, it didn't happen overnight for people, but over a long period of time, uh, more than 50% of the people um, in the study, you have to remember these were all people who were diagnosed or with uh, serious mental illness, and who at one time had been told that they uh, um, were going to spend the rest of their lives in the hospital, and then because of the way policies changed, were discharged from the hospital. But uh, 10, 15, and 20 years out, uh, more than half of the people were leading a life of full recovery defined as uh, not needing uh, traditional mental health services, um, not being on medication, um, living an integrated life in the community, being involved in, in relationships, uh, and uh, upwards of 75% uh, to in total were leading lives of complete or partial recovery, which meant they were still in some contact with the mental health system. And this was a group of people who were, at one point, had been considered hopeless and, and been relegated to the backwards of hospitals. So again, if we help people not to, you know, spend 10 or 20 years of, life, of their life in hospitals first, that they have so much to recover from. Uh, but this really holds out hope uh, that everybody really can recover. And um, again, now she's moving on to look at this concept of resilience, this concept of the fact that, that, that when we look at people across the board, including people with, with, with serious mental illness, we see that people have the capacity within them uh, to overcome all kinds of difficulties and to look for the, way, the things that help uh, to strengthen this ability in people and never to give up on people and say, well, this person has been so damaged uh, that they, they're, they're just hopeless. Um, we helping recognizing that, that, that change is real and possible uh, is, is, I think, the biggest step toward, move, toward moving a system in a recovery direction. And often it's very hard to see because progress can be very, very slow. Uh, I know when I look at some of the people who've uh, come through the drop-in center that, that, uh, that we started in Boston in 1988, uh, progress is so slow for some people that unless you look at it long term, you don't really see it at all. But when we started looking at 
um, who was coming here five years ago, you see, you could see that people would become, they would get, come into the drop-in center for the first time, they'd go through a period of engagement, uh, they'd decide this was a place they liked to be, they spent a lot of time there, for some people it was all day, every day, uh, and over a lengthy period, for some people three, four, five, six years, they would stop being such heavy users because they became involved in other things in life. They, somebody took a, I remember somebody who uh, um, had a very, very low level of literacy who decided she wanted to go back to school. And if you would ask me, you know, to predict who, who of this group is going to go back to school, she was one person I never would have predicted would have gone back to school. But she decided she wanted to go back to school and she became involved in an educational program, therefore spending less time in the center. So if you took snapshots every single day, it looked like there was no progress at all. But if you took snapshots here and a year from now and a year and a year and a year, then you began to see people's uh, moving and people's progress. And sometimes it's slow and steady, and sometimes it comes in leaps and bounds, and sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back. But if you look at it on a long-term basis, you see that people um, really do recover. So to sum up, I would say that uh, what we've learned from, from the recovery research, and it's not just our research um, at Boston University and at the uh, uh, National Empowerment Center, but it's looking at the, at the uh, developing research literature on recovery, that recovery is real, that it does happen for people, that it happens across all diagnoses, and that we have to look at it not as something, not as a service that's delivered, but as, as a process that we help to implement for people. We have to look for ways that support people's individual journeys of recovery and look for the uh, work together with people to help figure out uh, where they want to go and how they get there. Helping people to develop a recovery plan and a life plan. A recovery plan would be specifically uh, looking at uh, the factors that are associated with, with, with the illness or the disability. So helping people to identify, for example, what are the things that stress me out? Uh, what happens when I become stressed? What are the early warning signs for me? What, what's an indicator that things are going to go downhill unless I get some help? When that happens, what do I do? How does it, what does it look like on the outside? I know as somebody who struggles with depression, for me it's stopping answering the phone. If I stop answering the phone, that's a danger sign. It's something I have to, you know, be alert to. So it's helping people to identify what, the, what, the, what, those, what those early warning signs are. Uh, and it's putting in place things that work and things that don't work. For example, for, for me, when I, sometimes when I can't talk on the phone, I can email. So I'll say to some, some, I'll, 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 I'll say to somebody, I can't, I can't talk to you on the phone right now, but, uh, and I'll go on and I can, I'll, I'll do live chat with somebody, but I'm not ready to talk on the phone yet. So helping people to identify what works for them. Um, and then making sure that those things are available. And then helping people to see that this is part of, um, it doesn't, you know, going down doesn't mean disaster, it just means what you have to do to get yourself up at that point. So that's, a, that's what a recovery plan would look like. Also identifying what doesn't help. Um, helping people uh, to, to, to put into uh, a, a care plan. These are the things that will help me at this point. These are the things that really don't help at all. Please don't do this. For some people, it's specific medications. Uh, yes, when I'm really in bad state, this will help me. But if you give me that, I know from past experience, that won't help me. For other people, it's how much support or closeness they need. Some people want a lot of personal contact. Some people want very, very controlled contact. So it's working with that person's individual needs. Um, I had an experience some years ago. I was in a non-professional crisis center at a time when I was uh, having a psychotic episode. And it was a really healing place because that was the method that they used. They helped people to say what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And uh, one of the things I was experiencing was a very, very high level of fear and anxiety and I did not want to be alone. And this was a two-story house. The social parts of the house were on the main floor and the bedrooms were above. And when I came in, they showed me around and said, this is going to be, you know, upstairs, they showed me, this is going to be your bedroom. And to me, going up those stairs and going to this little, you know, room, just an ordinary bedroom, was terrifying, because it was away from life. 
And so the first night, they said, you know, it's time to go to bed. And I said, well, I really don't want to go sleep up there. I want to sleep right down here. So I can sleep on the couch here. And they said, well, you know, uh, you're going to kick everybody out of the living room. We want to do stuff. And I said, no, no, no. You can just stay here. Do what you want. Talk, play music, listen to television, whatever it is. I just want to sleep here because I want to know that there's people. And because this was a very flexible kind of place that, that you know, really worked with what people needed. And OK, fine. And the whole time I was there, I was there for about two and a half weeks. Well, time was there, so I'm happy. I never went to it into that bedroom because it's just too scary for me. So that flexibility and that really finding out what works for people and what helps people is how we help people toward, towards recovery and how we can help people to see that even at their most difficult moments, um, things are going to change. And, and one of the other things that was really wonderful about that program was after you left and you went back to your real life, um, they encouraged you to come back and be a volunteer and uh, work with other people who were in states of crisis. So it really helped you to see that, that a crisis is you know, real horrible when you're going through it. It doesn't mean the end of your life. It doesn't mean that you're not worthwhile and valuable. Um, so recovery is, is, is an, ongoing, an ongoing thing for people. It it's, um, has many, many different elements. Um, it's a sense of feeling that, 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 that there's a future, that there's um, meaning in your own life, uh, that you know uh, what you want and can identify the steps to get you to where you want, um, and that you can take your time and not uh, fulfill anybody else's schedule, your, the idea of you know, how you should recover and what kind of timetable you should recover. And again, I think that the mental health system is adjusting to this uh, in a lot of ways. I, I know that uh, many years ago, a lot of programs would work, well, we'll discharge someone from the hospital. They will live in this house for three months. And then we'll move them to this house, and they'll stay there for six months. And then we'll move them into this place, and they'll stay there for nine months. And then they're on their own. Goodbye. Life doesn't work like that. And I think as systems become more flexible, and we help people to uh, to get into living environments that are that are positive, and we provide support in ways that that you get more support when you need it, you get less support when you don't need it, and you can always tap back into it. Um, it's not uh, you know goodbye and farewell. We'll never see you again at the end of some specified period of time. Or maybe we'll never see you again when you're ready to go off and 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 um, uh, live your live your life. But maybe you come back from time to time because you you need a a little, a little more right now. Uh, it's recognizing that it's variable for people. Uh, it's recognizing that people define their own recovery. Uh, so if we, again, if we set up these artificial standards, well, this person's recovered if, they, if, they, uh, uh, if their kitchen is clean and they've uh, eaten nutritious meals today. Well, you know, uh, how many of us go up to that all the time? Uh, it's people's own standards of what, what's good for them. And it's recognizing that life, not just recovery from mental illness, but life, is a process of ongoing change and growth and development. Uh, and that all of us, whether we've been uh, given a psychiatric diagnosis or not, are um, engaged in our own journeys. And that uh, what people who are recovering have in common with people who've never been labeled is much more than they have a difference. Uh, that all of us, um, I hope, have aspirations have areas of our lives that we'd like to see change or develop or grow. Um, learning and, and uh, changing our, our lifetime enterprise. And uh, somebody with a, uh, a mental illness may need a little more assistance to go through that, uh, that process. But it's really no different from the process that, that, that other people go through um, as they define their lives and as they figure out um, what they like and don't like about their lives and as they figure out well, what do I have to do to change those things so that I can be living the kind of life that's more in line with what, what, what my hopes and dreams are? And that's recovery, and that's uh, where we want everybody to be moving. So thank you very much.
Um, no, what I meant is, is, is uh, look, plenty of people who've never been diagnosed as mentally ill decide they want to be in therapy uh, or decide they want some kind of, 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 of supportive services. What I, what I mean by partial recovery, or what I mean by full recovery, is a person's life being in line, moving along in the direction they want it to go in various domains. Not necessarily having reached all of them, because I don't think many of us have reached their goals. And what I mean by partial recovery is that you're seeing that the person is, is moving along, and the person themselves sees that they're moving along in, in those positive directions. So uh, again, I just want to reiterate that full recovery doesn't necessarily mean uh, no contact with the mental health system. If being some sort of ongoing contact with the mental health system is what somebody thinks they need, and is helping them to maintain themselves in those other areas of life. What is a recovery-oriented service? That's one of the things I'm engaged in uh, working on uh, right now, developing some of those guidelines. I think a recovery-oriented service is one in which services are individualized, in which people are engaged in their own active recovery planning, um, in which attention is paid not just toward to the reduction of symptoms, but toward the various domains of life and helping people to articulate where they want to go and how they get there. Um, in making sure that people um, um, have an opportunity to have ongoing input into what's, uh, what's helpful and what's not and what they need and, and, uh, um, and in which the system itself, the, the service delivery system itself, is as open to change uh, as the individuals uh, using the services. Uh, if we really mean that, that, that people have, have meaningful input, and I think uh, you were referring to this earlier, um, was um, that, that the, the, the systems of, of, of service themselves uh, are, going to, are going to change, that they're, they're, the systems are on themselves, I guess, in, in, in some sort of process of recovery um, and making it, um, um, Making sure that, 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 that if there's a lack of fit between the individual using the service and the service, that it's not, we don't just demand that the individuals change. We want the services also to change. Um, you know, a lot of the terms that are used in, in, in traditional uh, mental health treatment, like people being non-compliant, um, I think are, are, are very anti-recovery ways of thinking. Uh, people are non-compliant because they don't like the services. People are non-compliant because the services aren't meeting their, their needs. So if we're going to say, okay, the people you got, got, our goal has got to be make people compliant, uh, then we're saying, well, we, we know what we're providing is absolutely perfect, and it's just, it's all, you know, uh, something deficient in them that they're not doing it. It's much more uh, recognizing that 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 just as we're helping people to recover, we, we need to help uh, help <coughs> professionals to recover in what they do, and help services to recover by becoming uh, more genuinely. Uh, uh, helpful to people as they move through their, their, their journey. So it's a, it's a multifaceted process. How critical would you be of the psychiatric system in general? Uh, I'm pretty critical of the psychiatric system because I think that, that a lot of the training that psychiatrists get is still very much in this very uh, mechanistic medical model that says, uh, you know, that the only reason these people have, have a problem is they've got something wrong with their, with their brains and we just have to fiddle with their brain chemistry. Um, so that, that um, as psychiatry begins to, to genuinely grapple with, with issues of how can, how can we promote recovery, I hope psychiatry itself will change and become much more looking at the, at the whole person. Other questions? See movement, I don't see any hands going up, so uh, uh, I just want to thank you. Oh, here we go. And what would you say would be the core values and beliefs and attitudes that an individual... I'm sorry. Have, sorry. Well, well you're going to have to do it with those copies. That's good. Right. And what would you, how do you find core values, beliefs and attitudes that an individual mental health worker would need to bring in to a recovery focused relationship with their clients and their family? Core values would be that recovery is real and possible for people. 
that it's a joint enterprise, that it's not something that I as a professional do to you as the client, but it's something that we're engaged in together, uh, that people have value, um, that people's um, aspirations may differ from, from the, what the clinician may want, but that, 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 that it's the aspirations of the person themselves that are important. Um, and that recovery is this, is this multifaceted journey that, that, that uh, um, setbacks uh, don't necessarily mean uh, uh, defeat, that a that, that, uh, uh, person making a, a, a bad choice is not necessarily a symptom of illness, it's a symptom of humanity. Um, and that people, um, uh, at both, from, on both sides of the desk, uh, are capable of, of change and growth and, and, and development. So that could be some of the core values. And uh, I think we may be out of questions, unless I'm wrong. No? Just, no. Good, good. I'm just wondering, uh, just pulling that itself off a bit, but um, in terms of um, how we're employed by and who we might take the lead, and, and uh, you know, does, does, it, does it need to rely on the organization and perhaps all the way that you are treated as an individual? Um, or is it more about the um, you know, the way that you are treated as an individual? Or can you indeed believe that uh, you know, staff could go to learn and Evaluate services very much determine what kind of how, how we rate them. If, 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 if you're going to rate a service as excellent because everybody is compliant with medication, it's going to give you a very different kind of service uh, than, than if you rate a service by are people living where they want to live. Uh, so, so that you know, if, you're, if, if you as a, as a worker know that you're going to be rated by are your clients on medication, then you're going to spend a lot of time chasing after people who aren't taking their medication and make sure they take it. If on the other hand you're being rated as are people living where they want to live, and you're going to be paying attention to those things. So those are kind of top-down kinds of changes. We have to change the ways in which uh, the people who fund uh, and administer services evaluate them to say what is an excellent service. At the same time, we have to do this bottom-up stuff so that people are beginning to demand uh, the services that really meet their self-defined needs. And we have to look at the, at the roles of the individual workers who are often caught in the middle. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, workers are trying very hard to do things in an empowering way and to do things to help people recover and they have to do it almost clandestinely because they're not being supported by, the, by their, their administrators and, and by the, uh, the service designs that they're, that they're embedded in. So this, that, that's a middle level of, of change and, and, and uh, um, unless it happens at all those levels, I don't think we can really move uh, things in, in, a, in a direction that really helps people to recover. You know, to hand over on this side. Yes, I think that, that, that uh, both of them, both a, a recovery plan and a life plan are things that people would work on together with a person that they choose to work with, with, you know, or with a worker who they have um, you know, chosen, chosen to work with. A recovery plan is specifically focused on, on I think, the, the, the mental illness part of the equation, uh, the, the, the symptoms, the, the, the triggers, the, the things that help, the things that don't help. Um, yes, and, and, and a life plan is looking at the bigger issues, the issues around uh, housing, education, work, relationships, recreation, uh, spiritual life, uh, all the things that, that go into, all the strands that go into everybody's life. So recover a, 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 a plan that, that's just around your symptoms is one small part of a much larger recovery plan. And. Uh, Unless there are any more questions, I'd like to say thank you very much. We have some time for informal discussion. Well, I think we'd all like to say to Judy, thank you very, very much for a very informal discussion.